Uh, my name is Dennis Frame. I'm the director of Discovery Farms in Wisconsin. I spent the first 18 years of my career as a county extension agent, a dairy and livestock specialist. Started doing nutrient management and environmental work 20 years ago, so that's kind of my background in this whole thing. You're not going to see a ton of data because we've done a million data slides and a million presentations. So I'm going to go through what we're telling our producers right now in terms of how do they lower their risks of environmental loss. And for people like us in government, we've got to remember that there are always risks. There will never be zero risks. And we have to understand that at least the producers that I've had a chance to work with, they need to be profitable. Apologize. Not a problem. They need to be profitable and we need to keep them in business. And so we've just got to figure out how do we fit into their systems to reduce risk. So when we go through this data, we've got uh, this data set is 98 site years of surface water runoff. We've got 47 years of tile uh, runoff and we've got now 20 site years of in-stream monitoring uh, data. These would be the data sets that we work on when we sit down and talk about what we've seen on farms, what we know is working on farms. Uh, and in fact, one of our producers here, Joe Bragger, is, he was our very first Discovery Farms and you'll see some of what he's done to reduce runoff. So when I talk to our farmers about how do we reduce runoff and nutrient loads, our first thing is if you can get less runoff, it seems to make total sense. But if you can reduce runoff, you're gonna reduce your risk of nutrient losses. Why is that important? We've had farms in our state that lose half a percent of their annual rainfall. So you get 33, 34 inches and you lose half a percent versus 12 percent. Joe, I think your farm average and your, uh, where Joe farms, he's averaged about two thirds of an inch of runoff per year on slopes up to 33 percent, average 16 percent. Two thirds of an inch, if we go over the red clays, we see four inches. Would I rather lose four inches or would I rather lose two thirds of an inch? That's a big deal. So if we can reduce runoff, that's a whole key. So when we're on those red clay soils in the northeast part of the state, that's where we have our highest runoff. We see about 12 to 13 percent of annual precipitation runoff. You can't change clays. What can you do? You can't change your soil types, but you can look at your timing and your amount of tillage. You can actually look at installing tile. And tile is a four-letter word in Minnesota. I guess it's actually a four-letter word everywhere. But tile is not all bad. There are some huge advantages to tile. And we've had a lot of people who are looking at surface water losses and saying, you know, if we could reduce surface and get it into tile, um, that in this loss system might be a good idea. So the biggest factor we see is soil type, which you can't do much about. This is really a key. Uh, I think Amber, in our presentation last week, we talked about this. If we could get the rain at the right time, we don't have many problems. We've managed to handle four inch rains, five inch rains, if we can get them in August. We get a two inch rain in May after planting, or a one inch rain, or an intense half inch rain. You could do everything perfect in that timing, just screws you. I mean, those of you who spend time out in the field, you get everything planted, they've done everything right, it's all no-till, and you got saturated soils and a half inch rain, you know, you're gonna see big losses. And last year, in our two watershed projects, one of our watersheds got a really uh, intense storm right at the wrong time of year. So crop stage of development is something that's really important, but again, it's uncontrollable. Then that whole soil quality. What can you do to have high organic matter soils? Our one farm in southern part of Wisconsin has been no-till for 30 years. Organic matters on marks were four and a half, five, six percent. It took a lot to generate runoff on that farm. I mean, he could get a two, two and a half inch rain, no runoff. All the neighbors are running off, and you're going, this is perfect. Now, when he did get runoff, there was impact because he has a lot of residue on top. He has a lot of high phosphorus levels on top, but he had a lot less runoff. So again, we talk to, to our producers a lot about soil quality. What can you do to leave residue on top? No-till. The biggest thing and the reason I do a lot of talks right now is that we have a lot of agencies who believe they have the answer. Everybody in Wisconsin should do no-till or everybody should do grazing or everybody should do this or that. We've got to remember that there are some places in our state that no-till is not the option. I have producers who only no-till and I have producers who will never no-till. So I have to be able to work within those confines and don't tell them that they don't know what they're doing. Joe just left here. He's so funny, Joe's a big no-tiller. We've got a watershed where the guys can't no-till because of their soil types, and Joe's like, it's just because they're not smart, they don't understand, okay? These guys run four or 5,000 acres, I think they're pretty smart, 
and I think they know their land and I think they know what they're doing. So for me to bring a producer up there who basically looks at them and says, you just don't understand, it ticks them off. Now that doesn't happen in North Dakota, but it happens in Wisconsin. So we've got to remember that sometimes no till is not an option. We look at other alternatives, vertical tillage or other changes in tillage. And we've actually had some of our heavy clay people who are looking at deep tillage. But again, all of these things are designed to reduce that runoff equation. Uh, surface roughness, this is where the tillage comes in. We've got guys who look at residue rates, they look at doing some tillage at the right time. We've even got pit producers that come on and put on solid bedding pack manure to try to reduce that runoff and they're starting to experiment with what, when they do manure applications to reduce runoff. And then structural practices and you'll see this on Joe's. I had a guy tell me that on the Bragger farm here we should put in terraces on the whole farm, okay? That really seems pretty logical when you're looking at 60 and 18 up to 30% slopes. But if you've ever sat in a tractor on a 30% slope field, first of all, you feel like you're gonna die because it's like this. So I was sitting there with Joe one time and I said, you know, they were talking about putting terraces here and he said the most logical thing in the world to me. He said, when a chopper box decides to push this tractor down the hill, I have to turn and I have to go right away. And I'll be damned if I'm gonna go over a three foot cliff every 100 feet at 20 miles an hour. And I thought, that's actually pretty smart, yeah. I mean, it sounds like a great idea. In some places they work great, in some places they don't. Check dams, you'll see a lot of those on Joe's and farming on the contour. We're actually doing a watershed project now where the farmers don't farm on the contour at all. I thought, well, you guys are really, really behind time until I started looking at their field size and their field layoff and their slopes. And because of their structural system, they do things a little bit different. So there is no one structural practice again. If you start to look at all these, you've got to remember that they may take this or they may take this or they may take something else. And then this one here is the biggest one. And uh, Tim Raditz is going to talk about soil moisture. It's his job to figure out how we're going to look at storm duration and intensity. If we could control that a little bit more, we could really solve a lot of the runoff problems in our state. Tiles. In our state, when we see tiles flowing at or near capacity, though you talked about frozen ground, really a big problem in our state. But the other problem is saturated soils. They're about the same. So we move the, we move the issue of winter runoff to the issue of spring runoff in our state. So if we ban winter spreading, we've then moved it to the next highest risk period in our whole state. And when our tiles are flowing at capacity, we have some really unique challenges. I put this one on here because one of our biggest success story discovery farms had almost zero runoff. This farmer was so excited about his system, he's like, if everybody farms like me, look at I have no runoff. Well, then we started looking at the pictures and in snow melt, he had this huge water column moving right towards our flume and it disappeared. It never made the flume. And he's like, wow, look at this system. And we're all going, that doesn't happen. You see a whole stream of water and then it disappeared. Well, then we started looking at the geology and there's a lot of karst regions there. He doesn't have a lot of surface runoff. If we could get a timely sinkhole in front of all of our monitoring stations, it's awesome. Just awesome for what we do for monitoring. Not necessarily that good for other systems. So. We had to really go back through and start checking that so we knew we were doing equal comparisons because data can look very different between farms. Again, this is our biggest thing. You heard Doyle say it, snow cover, frozen ground. So the depth of, of water out there, just because you have a lot of snow doesn't mean it's gonna run off. I don't know if you've seen this Doyle, but we've had years where we have a ton of water and everybody's like, oh my God. And then we get the perfect snow melt. Or you get a year this year where we had rain on snow and we got a lot of frozen ground and we have two inches of ice it doesn't matter what you do this year, it's coming off. And we've actually had a watershed project for two years that Amber and I did a report in that their phosphorus levels are as low as we've ever seen. And we did a meeting there two weeks ago and we told the guys, no matter what happens, your numbers are going up. Because we've had drought and we look at the water that's sitting here and look at the rain that you've had and look at the ice, this year's gonna look bad. How are we gonna explain that data? So we looked at early melt periods, lots of snow, all of these factors, we really learned how to predict whether runoff is going to happen. And our goal is can we provide producers with a management risk? We just are coming off snow melt period. Two weeks ago in Wisconsin, on a Friday, they were predicting rain on Saturday. And there were a ton of people spreading manure at the worst possible day. And, I, and people are calling me, go, are these guys stupid? You guys didn't understand that 20 minutes before on the radio, guess what the announcement was? Road bands are going on in two days. All the road bands are going on. 
Okay, so if I'm a producer and I got manure sitting everywhere, I got a feedlot or I got a barnyard, I got a manure system almost full, and I know I got X days before road bands, that's a big deal. So somehow we've got to manage that out. We've got to figure that out. So these are really important things that we're trying to work with producers so that they don't get backed into a corner so that they look bad. Again, rain on snow is bad. Rain on frozen ground is bad. We've got to look at these regulations and recommendations for winter applications that are based on conditions, not calendar dates. We've actually had times in our state where in January we've told people, get out and get your manure on. I don't care if the ground is frozen, there's no snow, it's perfect time. I would rather have you spread now than be sitting in March or even the first week of April, right? like right now at home. It's a terrible time period. Uh, soil moisture levels, Tim's actually going to do this talk, but we've actually learned a lot about how moisture levels affect that's non-frozen period. We think there's a ton of work that we can do with the agricultural industry to reduce runoffs on the, on the non-frozen period. And that's where this whole high risk period, we can see a lot of losses almost equal to the snow melt in May and June in our state. Maybe a little different for you, Doyle. But this period for us is almost equal to the snow melt period. And all we're going to do is shift from the frozen ground to this period, and this may be worse. So we've got to look at this low moisture period too this year. Last year in the drought, we had a lot of liquid manure going through cracks on these uh, clays. Those clays all have tile below them, and that's just like running manure right into the tile line. So they almost needed to do tillage, and in fact in the Northeast we recommend tillage before you apply liquid dairy manure. What's the other things that we tell producers to do? Well that's really looking at nutrient applications. No-till is really good because again, you see, a, uh, you see a lot of less runoff, you see a lot less sediment losses, but we can increase dissolved phosphorus loss. I was looking at a talk that I'm going to do tomorrow on phosphorus. We've got a 30-year no-till farm that actually lost more pounds of phosphorus, 3.1 pounds per year over a five-year period than our state average in our studies, which is two. 85% of that is dissolved reactive because all of their phosphorus is on top of the ground. And the farmer's really proud. He goes, you never see any sediment loss. My water is perfectly clean. And I said, yeah, but the phosphorus here is going to be harder to treat once it comes off this farm because it's all dissolved reactive and it runs off. So we've got to remember that that you may change the type of loss, but you're not necessarily dropping phosphorus loss. So we've got to take a look at this kind of stuff. And that's why Joe and I will argue that no-till is part of the solution, but it's not the only solution. Tile drainage factors in our state, we've got a lot of tile drainage in eastern Wisconsin. It's a major contributor. We run all of our tile, like everybody else, to surface water. We don't have mapping, and breaks in tile obviously make it just like a, a regular stream site. Over applications of nutrients are really important. Almost everybody in this room does nutrient management. We've all had farmers who spread their manure perfectly the first time. I, I did a feedlot one a couple of years ago, and the guy went out and, and spread it, and I know this farmer for years, and his calibration was right on, and I said, John Butch, this is perfect. And he smiled at me and he goes, yeah, I know. And then I looked at him and said, how many times do you do it? And he goes, three. And I said, well, oh, great. Well, the first time you had the right application rate, but you do it three times and you do it on the same fields every year. And he just smiled. We've got to get this application. And manure is important and it's expensive and it's valuable, so we've got to really do a lot of education there. We've also got to remember the grazing system. Our highest losses ever measured in Wisconsin were on grazing systems. It's where they overwinter cattle. These overwintering paddocks are really important as well as stocking density. <coughs> Large storms are huge. You're talking about climate change. These storms can have major impacts. And in fact, on Joe's farm, uh, the two years that we monitored there, the large storms contributed most of the phosphorus losses, not nitrogen. Grass waterways are critical. You'll see that on, Joe, on Joe's thing. And water movement in the southwest can be that uh, bedrock geology. So again, we've got to look at lack of runoff. Believe it or not, we did one farm on the sands, pure sands. They have a really narrow window when runoff is. It's on frozen ground on snow melt. And they can get a lot of runoff. And all the BMPs in the world, you gotta be designed for that one runoff period. And you gotta think about it. It's totally different than other parts of our state. If I showed you the data, all farms matter. We've had our biggest losses on a hobby farm. A guy who had 13 acres who absolutely loved to farm, loved to do tillage. And while his neighbor was losing 160 pounds of sediment per acre, he was losing 6,000 pounds of sediment per acre. But because of his scale, he said it wasn't important. All farms are important, regardless of what your size is. Remember that on a per acre basis. So we found that farmers adopt and make changes uh, based on their beliefs, value, and personal knowledge. 
We did a workshop a couple of weeks ago and I said, all right, how many are no-tillers? And they all raised their hands and I said, if I asked you all to do tillage to incorporate the top layer, would you do it? There wasn't a person in that room that would do tillage. So give that one up. The other hand, if they're not gonna do no-till, you could do no-till seminars every single day. It's a waste of time. So figure out what their beliefs and their values are and figure out how to modify that system. And remember that most farmers are aware that of water quality issues, but most of the guys I work with believe their farming systems are good. They don't farm um, and ignore stuff. We try to get adoption and changes on the land. You have to develop trust and respect for the producers, and you have to be open. You have to understand that, believe it or not, I don't always agree with Joe, and I let him do stuff that I don't think is going to work, <laughs> and I'm always surprised when it does. So. You kind of have to be flexible. You can't go out there and say, I know exactly what you're doing wrong because Joe doesn't think uh, you know anything. And that's true for him and me, and I've been working with him for 20 years. So that's basically what we've done, and that's how we reduce risk in the state of Wisconsin on our farms.